Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Linguistics, I'd like to welcome you to the 11th Annual Joshua and Verona Watmo Lecture in Linguistics. I'm Jay Jasnoff. We owe this event, like its 10 predecessors, to the generosity of the Watmo family, and especially of the late Mrs. Verona Taylor Watmo. Joshua Watmo was born and educated in England. He was initially trained as a classicist, and in 1926 was brought to Harvard by President Lowell, university presidents did that then, <clears throat> and spent the rest of his career here. In 1941, he became the founding chair of the Department of Comparative Philology, which changed its name 10 years later to the Department of Linguistics. The change in name from comparative philology to linguistics reflected the widening of Professor Watmo's interests from the study of Latin, Italic, and Gaulish inscriptions to language more generally. He was especially intrigued by the use of information theory and other mathematical models as an aid to this study. The focus of his later work is reflected in his 1955 book, Language, a Modern Synthesis. Joshua Watmo died in the first year of his retirement in 1964. He was survived by his wife, Verona, to whose generosity we owe these lectures, by their children, Jeremy Watmo and the late Theodora Watmo Green, and by their grandchildren. Jeremy Watmo had to cancel his attendance at today's proceedings, unfortunately, but it is, as always, a pleasure to see here today Fred Green, the original Watmo couple's son-in-law, and the two Watmo grandchildren, Phil and Alan Green, and Phil's wife, Kathy, all here in the front. We now move to the more academically focused part of today's proceedings, but before we do, let me remind you that after the lecture and the question period, there'll be a reception on the first floor of the Harvard Faculty Club, a five or six minute walk away. Everybody's welcome to that. And now it's time to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Alec Morantz, for which purpose I'd like to call on my colleague, Jim Huang. Hello, good evening. I have the unique pleasure and honor to be called upon to do this because Alec Morantz and I went to graduate school together in spite of him being quite a few years younger than me. We were in the same 1978 entering class at MIT Graduate School of Linguistics. And uh, in spite of what I just said, what I said uh, he was in more than one way, and actually in many ways, uh, uh, one step at least, sometimes a one giant step, sometimes a real big step uh, ahead of me and also of, uh, of the class. So in 1978 when we came uh, as a first year graduate student, Alec was already here for a year, He's spending one year as a visiting student, uh, having uh, finished his uh, BA degree in Oberlin College in three years. And then, uh, therefore, uh, in 1981, he graduated, one year ahead of the class as well. And he received a position as a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows, where he stayed here for three years before uh, uh, starting his uh, teaching job at the UNC, North Carolina. Then, uh, in 1990, he was uh, summoned back or invited to come back to MIT uh, to teach where he taught for 16 years or so in 19, uh, 2000, until 2006 when he went to NYU where he had been a chair of the Department of Linguistics. Okay. While at MIT in the first few years, he uh, uh, made a big, actually, big step to develop together with work, working with uh, Professor Morris Halley uh, to develop a theory of the architecture of grammar called distributed morphology. The theory um, uh, is aptly summarized by the catchy title of one of his papers published in a sort of obscure publication place called UPenn Working Papers. And the title is, No Escape from Syntax. Don't try morphological analysis. 
in the privacy of your own lexicon. <laughs> that says it all, okay? Uh, the essence, right? The theory of distributed morphology has made, in fact, a fundamental difference in our view of the relationship, the nature of grammar, and the relationship between syntax and the lexicon. And it has, for more than 20 years, been guiding a lot of research in the field. And while language over those years were busy working under the influence of distributed morphology, during the late 90s, Alec Narantz took another giant step and began a program of research in cognitive neuroscience. He established the MIT KIT, uh, 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 Kana, Kanazawa Institute of Technology in Tokyo, the KIT, the Joint Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. He pioneered the research techniques of MEG, a non-invasive neural imaging and neural monitoring instrument that measures brain activities on a millisecond by millisecond basis to address important questions of linguistic theory and analysis and language use and language acquisition, sometimes helping to determine between competing theories in the linguistics battleground. He has continued with this, these efforts since moving to NYU, now having established another center at two NYU locations, one right in the Big Apple and the other one in the city of Abu Dhabi. All these activities together mean a giant step. In fact, one might even call it a great leap forward. Although those of us who know about the great leap forward in China may not like that term very much. <laughs> they didn't think it was gonna be successful. But this one actually has turned out to, has proven to be considerably successful. Already it has had a transforming effect on the field. Quite a few people, a number of his uh, trainees in his lab and his classes, okay, for example, um, Colin Phillips, David Popple, David Embert, and some of their students, John Sprouse, for example, grand, grand student of, grandchild student of his, all have established themselves. In fact, they are now leading a new generation of very active researchers produced from their labs in the field. They are conducting linguistically informed research in cognitive neuroscience. In the meantime, the MEG has become a favorite technique for language-related research and has been adopted in other parts of the world, in the United States and other parts. And uh, uh, just speaking from the places that I know about, uh, Australia, in uh, Tokyo, in Taipei, and also in Beijing. By the way, if some of you would like to buy a, an MEG machine <laughs> for your lab or for your own bedroom, because, because it's very non-invasive, okay, it must be enjoyable. You might speak to Eric, Alec, he might be able to arrange a discount for you because he knows this place very well, the manufacturer. But you have to speak to him and he will talk about it today. So here, let's welcome Alec Morantz. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. That's, I'm happy to be back here at Harvard. Um, though uh, when I was here at Harvard, um, linguistics was a, um, a peripatetic, how do you say? It, it, would, it, would, it would never, from year to year, you didn't know where it was gonna be. I mean, it would, you know, one year you would be in the basement somewhere and the next year it would be somewhere else. Is that, remember those years? Anyone? Yeah, uh, it's good, uh, but it's now, this is a nice home. <laughs> Um, so you know, I'm going to describe uh, what uh, Jim talked about as the uh, as a great leap forward in terms of a um, a great leap back. <laughs> That's the uh, topic the for today. Um, so 
uh, contemporary linguistics has its roots here in Cambridge in the 1950s. Um, one way to look at the birth of uh, contemporary linguistics is as a response to contemporary, uh, then contemporary American structuralists' approaches to linguistics. Um, and put together, uh, which had at the time been put together with um, behavior psychology. And Chomsky imagined a different approach that joined uh, a structuralist analysis of linguistic patterns with a computational analysis of the rules necessary to generate these pa patterns. So what types of, mathematically, what types of rules are they? Um, together with a cognitive psychology investigation of the acquisition and use of the rules, and a neurolinguistic investigation of the neural underpinnings of uh, rule acquisition and, and use. And this field, bec uh, this is Wikipedia that tells us all about it, it became cognitive science. You can see the, um, there, there are all those disciplines together. And, um, and Shortly in the 1970s, and um, you get a sort of codification of what cognitive science is about, um, often uh, referring to David Marr's um, discussion of what, uh, what cognitive science is like for vision science. And uh, Marr used linguistics as a kind of example of methodology in cognitive science. And he had uh, described levels of analysis. You can barely see them down here. Um, that describe analysis at the computational level, a uh, uh, algorithmic level, and a hardware implementation or neural level. Um, my understanding was when, uh, uh, in the early 1980s, if you were, for example, a graduate student in cognitive science, you would be expected on your general examination to be able to uh, uh, rep repeat what Morris said and explain how it applied to your own subdomain of cognitive science. Um, now, for me, the, um, there's something crucial to the essence of linguistics as cognitive science, which um, I call here the single competence hypothesis. And that a single representational competence system, which Chomsky often has called the knowledge of language, underlies all linguistic performance. In particular, there's no specialized comprehension competence or language production competence. And in particular, there's no special competence for making judgments of grammaticality. And there's a corollary to that, which is that there's no privileged data for linguistics. There's no particular type of behavioral or brain data that is a priori more decisive for theories of linguistic um, competence. Uh, now, for me, this has been. Um, quite important for the work I do, experimental work I do in, in psychoneurolinguistics. So um, you know, despite rumors to the contrary, this is a very um, uh, productive uh, assumption to make. And I'll talk about how we use it in an uh, area of my particular experimental expertise, which is word recognition. And the idea is that the computational hypotheses that you derive from the latest and the bestest theories of morphology uh, drive discoveries in brain science. But um, looking back, the question is, what happened to linguistics as cognitive science after the 1950s? Now, computer science starting at least in the 1960s, embraced what you might call short-term engineering goals. So anyone who's read Chomsky in the, from the 1950s knows that finite state models can't be a model of uh, linguistic competence. Um, however, um, they might yield the best performance towards engineering goals. And so they were adopted by um, computational linguists, despite the fact that everyone knew that they were not the right theory of, uh, of, uh, of language for uh, uh, of linguistic competence. What is less commonly told to uh, you graduate students when you uh, study the history of linguistics is that um, by the 1970s, psycholinguists had abandoned the single competence hypothesis. 
and their job became to explore special strategies for language use that didn't involve a linguist grammar. And so in a landmark book, is it, who has it on their shelves? No one anymore, yes. Okay, at least one person. Uh, Psychology of Language, 1974. This book announces that um, cognitive science is over. <laughs> Now, it's already, by 1974, it's about why you want to have a psycholinguistics of specialized um, uh, routines and algorithms for language that don't involve linguistic competence. Now, I started graduate school in the 1970s, and no one told me that the party was already over. <laughs> um, so I went through graduate school, you know, thinking that we were still doing cognitive science. And it was a bit frustrating talking to psychologists, but you know, I, I, I thought we were all on the same page, but we were not. <laughs> Already in the uh, 1970s, we weren't on the same page. And you know, 40 years later, um, independence of, um, the independence of psycholinguistics, that is that whatever the psychology of language about, is about, it's not about um, linguistic competence, is still the dominant view. I just, uh, got sent this uh, paper, um, once again, by linguist Eric Royland, arguing against this view that um, language processing actually can, happens without um, uh, linguistic knowledge. So th this is a quote from the paper, in the psycholinguistic literature has often been proposed that readers and listeners often adopt a good enough strategy, good enough processing strategy, in which a shallow representation of an utterance um, has a processing advantage over a deep, grammatically driven representation of that same utterance. So this notion of good enough that I said was uh, uh, you know, important for uh, computational linguistics is also what's um, driving this psycholinguistic research. And they, so they contrast this view of deep processing. Um, uh, here's a quote, the split between linguistics and psycholinguistics in the 1970s has been interpreted as being a retreat by linguists from the notion that every operation of the grammar is a mental operation that a speaker must perform in speaking and understanding language. But putting history aside for the moment, we as linguists cannot take the position that there's another way to construct mental representations of sentences other than the machinery of grammar. So there is no retreat from the strictest possible interpretation of grammatical operations as the only way to construct linguistic representation. So this is the um, single competence hypothesis. And as I said, I couldn't have said it any better myself. And in fact, I did this, they, they're quoting me on this. Um, and they're contrasting that with the shallow processing view that, um, that uh, comprehension must assume simple processing heuristics. And this is associated with experimental work by Fernanda Ferrara, and this is a quote from her. Um, so I'd like to be, uh, I'm uh, optimistic mood lately. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, uh, come with good news. My understanding of what's going on now these days is that there's been a rebirth of linguistics as cognitive science. And I wish it was because of linguists that we've just become more persuasive, but I'm coming to believe that we have Moore's Law to thank for this. And you know, if I'm, if I'm right, you, you said you, you've heard it here first, April, whatever it is, uh, 2016, you know, the, uh, intellectual historians will go back and see if I'm right. But I think it's been the development of more powerful computational tools, both for computer science and neuroscience, that has led to the uh, rebirth of uh, linguistics as cognitive science. So when you have um, current computer technology at your fingertips, and you have a population that is not so happy with Siri, it's just not quite what it should be. Um, basically, good enough isn't good enough anymore. So um, when good enough isn't good enough anymore, um, Google starts hiring linguists again. And it's happening. Uh, it makes it hard for us. We just hired a, a computational linguist in, uh, at NYU. It was tough. You know, it has to be someone a little crazy. So, no, I do not want that million dollar salary from Google. I, I would like to teach your undergraduates. <laughs> um, 
even if I'm wrong about uh, what's behind the rebirth of linguistics as cognitive science, I'm in the, I can share some examples of how it works, or how it should work, too. And what you may not have noticed, um, and I hope to, I'm going to show you some pretty pictures, showing you that um, neuroscientists are beginning to exploit theories of linguistic representation to illuminate neural processing in the human brain. And because neurosciences are on board, this feeds back. And we can do this type of experiments that we really want to do um, to address uh, in, using neural processing to address questions of linguistic representation. Okay? So these are case studies in word recognition from linguistics to brains and back again. And I'm going to show you, a, I'm just going to wave at some pictures that show you that linguistics has been guiding discoveries in cognitive neuroscience, and particularly um, discovery of an elaboration of a computational area um, that's called uh, the visual word form area in the human brain, and also in um, the elaboration of the computations performed by um, phonetic feature detectors in the superior temporal lobe of the brain. And I'm going to show you some experiments that monitor the activity of the visual word form area that help decide between theories of morphology and um, theory of morphemes. And some experiments monitoring activity from the superior temporal lobe that decide between theories of word representation and theories of the verbal root. Uh, you may have noticed that I am even more nasal than usual. I, I am a little stuffed, so uh, I'll try to speak clearly, but. Um, uh, if, if something, if it, if at some point it just sounds like, eh, you know, try to stop me. A, I'll, I'll try to breathe <coughs> better. <coughs> um, so what do we know about visual word recognition? That's reading, right? Reading words. Um, word recognition involves what's called the ventral stream of uh, visual object recognition. It's going to the bottom of the brain. <laughs> That's also crucial to um, recognizing faces and other objects, but is uh, left lateralized when you're recognizing words. And when you see something like a word, um, processing runs from early visual uh, areas in the back of the brain forward along this bottom stream. Um, and the, uh, apparently the representations being processed get more and more abstract as you move forward. So, Around 130 milliseconds after you see a word, for example, the uh, activity is sensitive to things like the frequencies of pairs of letters, bigram frequencies. And the frequency of um, the letters that go into suffixes, for example, as letter strings, but not as, uh, not as morphological objects. Later on, about 170 milliseconds, um, you're sensitive to things like the frequency, what's called lemma frequency, which is the frequency of a stem of a word. And to something I'll mention, I'll, I'll talk more about, which is the transition probability from the stem to a suffix. If you have a word like uh, uh, baker, um, what's the likelihood of er given that you've seen the stem bake? That's the transition probability from the stem to the suffix. Um, a lot of beautiful work. This is uh, Vinkier et al. Or I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's, it's work from the lab of Stanislas Dehan and, and Cohen, Lyle well, Cohen. And um, this is just indicating using MRI that as you move from the um, things that are less word-like to things that have more and more of the statistical structure of words, like things like this is bigrams, that is strings of letters where the pairs of letters are um, uh, respect the um, orthography of the language, but uh, not the um, the whole the whole string is not a word. Um, basically, as you move uh, from the back to the front, the, um, the sensitivity is to more and more linguistically um, relevant representations. Now, at the moment, I, uh, neuroscience is being led by cognitive science here. So just a couple weeks ago, I was at the annual meeting of the um, Society for Cognitive Neuroscience, the Cognitive Neuroscience Society, and the George A. Miller Prize, George A. Miller, cognitive scientist, was given to uh, Brian Wandell, who gave a talk about um, reading circuitry. Now, reading is a, um, is a, is a cognitive task. <laughs> and he talked about this work by, uh, here, here are the guys, Cohen and DeHaan. This is, a this is one of his slides um, that 
And he explained how they use essentially cognitive tools uh, in neuroscience to identify this thing, the visual word form error, the VWFA, here in the bottom of the brain. And this is another slide from his talk. It's again showing how um, a word presented off center. Um, um, you can measure the sensitivity, this, this is the visual field of the visual word form error here by um, moving the word around in the visual field of the subject. Um, those of you who, who are familiar with fMRI work from maybe 10 years ago, where you see these big white blobs in different parts of the brain while people are like seeing words or hearing words, you're familiar with it. Uh, it's come a long way. And, and, and it, this, these maps from fMRI studies, the, the fact that you can do this has to do with the um, uh, progress in, in, in computer science and computers. Couldn't do this 10 years ago. Um, so here is this visual word from area. And here in a single subject is the field of view in the reading circuitry of here in that area. Um, where they uh, where they just move the um, the words around in the um, in the uh, visual field of view of the subject and measure the response. Um, it's quite amazing. Now that's cognitive science feeding into neuroscience. Um, now. Before I show you the next thing, I want to explain something to I, I, that I, I haven't explained to people when I've talked about this work before, and I think it's important. Um, if you, a standard view of a morpheme in linguistics is, uh, is a Saussurian view. That is, a morpheme is a sound meaning connection. So like the, a plural morpheme might be the connection between uh, S and the meaning plural. Um, now, the, there's a tradition in neuropathology, um, uh, and Alfonso Karamata, who is, whose lab is here, uh, is at the lead of this. Um, they found evidence in aphasia for dissociations that are kind of weird from the point of view of the standard notion of a morpheme. So um, you have patients that can um, uh, understand a word if it's said to them, but they can't read it or vice versa. So if you, can, uh, if you can point to a cat when you hear cat, but you can't point to the cat when you see the word cat, or vice versa, what's your damage? So given standard notions of what a, of what a morpheme is and a lexicon of morphemes, people started talking about orthographic input and output lexicons. There's multiple representations of these morphemes of, of the meaning form connections in different parts of the brain because damage to different parts of the brain can selectively impair either writing or reading or speaking or hearing. Um, now, it took a while for linguistics to catch up with this, but the theory of distributed morphology that uh, Jim told you about um, separates the representation of morphemes from their form. So something like a plural morpheme is an abstract plural morpheme that's realized phonologically as z, for example, as in dogs, and semantically is whatever your favorite theory is, more than one. That's, that's wrong, you know. So um, we're in a position now to study the forms of morphemes independent of the lexical representations of the morphemes. And that's useful because I want to study um, morphology through having people look at words because it's convenient experimentally for a number of reasons. But we can talk about the orthographic forms of morphemes, which reside in some sense in this visual word form area, safely under the single competence hypothesis. We don't have to change linguistic theory in order to talk about um, uh, the forms of morphemes in this reading area. And we can study language through reading as well as listening. I'm going to talk about both things today. So. Um, the, the work I'm talking about now is, uh, is, uh, is led by Laura Williams, a graduate student in my lab. Um, and she's, she's, she is, um, can make slides. I can just type words on PowerPoint, but she, she can make these things that look nice. So 
Um, here is MEG. You are, um, you have these sensors around the head. They're measuring ch changing magnetic field over time. So below there is, uh, on the lower left is um, those overlay lines are changing magnetic field for each one of the sensors above. You, and the head is just showing you a, a, a contour map of the changing magnetic fields over time. I think if you saw the wiggling, that's, um, uh, yeah, the, that wiggling is over, uh, changing magnetic field over time. You can see the same change in the graphs from each sensor on top of each other. Um, we can use that information to figure out the activity on the cortical surface in the, uh, of the brain. So going from the sensors measuring, measuring change, changing magnetic field to um, the uh, current sources in the cortex. And below you just see now lines summarizing uh, activity not from sensors but from points on the cortex now. We move from sensor space to source space. And you can uh, look at, um, now these are lines again for activity in, in source space and you can average over time periods of interest and get uh, each of those is response to a different condition like a different type of word. Um, but more importantly these days what we can do is correlate the brain activity with different uh, properties of the stimuli that we're showing to subjects. For example, uh, these are variables that um, if you have lower frequency, you have more activity. If you have lower bigram frequency of the, of the frequency of the letters, you have higher activity and so forth. Now, from this less to more abstractness from the back to the front of the brain, uh, in MEG we've shown that um, uh, things like letter bigram frequency correlates with activity about 130 millisecond in that blue spot. <laughs> and lemma frequency, that's the stem frequency of a word like uh, farmer or baker, farm or bank, um, or correlates with the activity at about 170 milliseconds, a little bit further up in the brain. Um, now transition probability, um, which I call the anti-pinker variable because this is a, uh, it's the, um, again, the probability of getting a particular suffix given the stem. It's the anti-pinker variable because no matter how regular your morphology is, say regular past tense, um, your brain is sensitive to this transition probability, which means that there's a sense in which you've stored information about the whole word, walked because I can show you that the, uh, the probability of getting ud after walk uh, correlates with brain activity at this point. Um, so morphological processing, the decomposition of a word into stem and suffix happens at this, in this visual word form area around 170 milliseconds after you see the word. Um, now, Um, let me go through this quickly, but what we've shown is we can, I, I showed you these beautiful maps before from functional MRI and, and, and other people's labs that had these little areas for visual word form area outlined on the cortical surface. How do we find that area in a subject, right? Well, it turns out we've developed a, uh, a beautiful functional localizer for the earlier response that's sensitive to uh, frequencies of pairs of letters, less abstract representation, and the later response that's sensitive to things like transition probability from stem to suffix. So what we do is we show words um, in increasing noise, and um, an area that's sensitive to bigrams is one that shows less activity when you obscure the letters. Very early processing, the more noise you see, the more activity there is. This area, which cares about letters, if you obscure the letters, you get less activity. So we get that, and that turns out to be a localizer for this um, 
I'll we'll show you in a second. The other thing we do is just a, a simple contrast between words and, and, um, and symbols that have the same amount of visual stuff. That shows a distinction in this area about 170 milliseconds after you see the word. So we use these as um, functional localizers and then we look in these areas and we find that the area we identified by showing less activity when there's more noise is the area that, whose activity correlates with um, bigram frequency or the frequency of a suffix as letters as opposed to the frequency as, of the suffix as suffix. You know, like ER occurs at the end of a word when it's not a suffix and when it is a suffix. So it's frequency as letter string sums over all of the, the times ER occurs at the end of the word. This frequency as a suffix only when it's used as a suffix. And here, this, the area that we've identified by just contrasting letter strings and symbol strings that area is showing a uh, correlation with the transition probability from stem to suffix for a set of words and the frequency of the stem, right? Not the frequency of the whole word, right? But the frequency of the stem. So that's nice. If you have asked me uh, a few years ago whether I would be publishing a paper in NeuroImage, my answer would be, what is NeuroImage? <laughs> Okay, so now we have, um, we have this visual word form area and we have a way of identifying it. What's a linguistic question we can ask that's still open? What about words like vulnerable and excursion? Vul vulnerable and excursion. Vulnerable has the meaning of a dispositional adjective in able, right? Able to be hurt, vulnerable. But it has a stem, vulnerable, vulnerable. <laughs> that doesn't occur elsewhere in English, right? Excuse me? And excursion has what you'd expect uh, a nominalization of a verb to mean. It's an inventive nominalization, excursion, trip. But excurse is not a verb, or anything, actually. So here's a question. Do speakers represent words with unique stems as combinations of a unique stem and a suffix, like is vulnerable, vulnerable, and obel, or is it a word by itself? Okay. Is that a live question? Well, um, here's a paper, a book by a famous linguist, Dixon, 2014. It says, to be recognized as a stem morpheme, a form must either occur as a free form, a word by itself, making up a complete word, or occur with the same meaning in more than one word. Okay, that's a very traditional notion of what a stem is. Vulnerable and escourge don't count because they don't occur as words by themselves. They don't occur in any other word. So, um, however, the theory of distributed morphology would say, in fact, that you do decompose vulnerable into vulner and obel, and vulner is a bound stem. Now, if vulnerable is represented as morphologically complex, it should be decomposed in visual word recognition. What's the transition probability between vulner and obel? Well, it's one, because whenever you see vulner, the only time it occurs is with invulnerable, right? Now, it should be distinguished, words like vulnerable be, should be distinguished from words like winter, right? Now, winter looks like it could be wint and er, right? But it doesn't mean anything like someone who X's, that could, what wind could mean, right? So there, there's no winting. You can't, winter is not someone who does something. It's a season, right? So the grammar cannot support a decomposition of winter into wind and ER, right? So now, We've done, a, it, there's a nice confluence between the exper uh, purely behavioral experimental literature and the, uh, and the brain stuff that we've done here. Um, in um, a technique called mask priming, which I'm going to use in the next experiment I'm going to tell you about, so I'll tell you about it here. You, uh, here you um, present a word like corner very, very briefly with a forward and backward mask so that people are not conscious of having seen it. Then you present a word like corn. You ask, having unconsciously seen corn, or do you get an advantage in processing corn? 
And the answer is yes. However, uh, that makes sense for farmer, but what about a word like brother, right? Does that, having unconsciously seen brother, do you get an advantage on processing broth, right? Some people are shaking their heads no, but the answer is yes, you do. And why? Well, broth ER has a stem broth in it and a suffix, so you actually do decompose that. Not only do you decompose it, but you can compute the transition probability from BROTH to ER, right? So of all the uses of broth and brother, <laughs> What's the likelihood, if you see B, the broth part, that it will be followed by ER? So what is the comparative frequency of brother compared to broth, right? This visual word form area, its activity correlates with the transition probability from broth to ER. For, uh, it does. I'll show you that again here. <laughs> um, so the words that are shown to be decomposed via mass priming, we also show to be decomposed by our activity at the visual word form area. Everything is coming together very nicely. So, what about vulnerable and winter? Okay, so let's compare excursion type words, which are vulnerable type words with unique stems, with winter, where visually they're exactly the same, right? If you didn't look at the grammar, you would see there's a possible suffix, E-R, and the stem, went, right? There's this possible suffix, I-O-N, and the stem, excursion. Visually they're the same. It's only when you have the grammar that you know that winter couldn't be the E-R on some stem because it doesn't mean what it should mean, where excursion does mean what it should mean if it's shown on some stem. Comparing that with leakage words, which are leak, which are uh, you know obviously decomposable because leak is a word, and brother words, which are decomposed because broth is a word, but they're mistakenly decomposed. <coughs> Four sets of words, right? Um, there's all this fancy animation that Laura did that. Um, Lexical decision experiment, that is, you're seeing uh, strings of letters, your task is to make a decision, is it a word or not? We did this localizer that we, um, I talked about, you know, words versus symbols, words and noise, to identify our early and late processing areas in the visual stream. And we had 25 native English participants in Abu Dhabi, where the data are beautiful, so we go there. Um, First, we looked, we averaged over the area and the time range around the peak of this response and asked if we could get, what, what kind of model best explains the, the grammar, and we compared um, one that says all that counts is whether you have a suffix versus all that counts is whether you have an isolatable stem versus all that counts is that you are uh, consistent with the grammar versus what counts is that you have an isolatable stem, like for brother, and or you're congruent with the grammar, like excursion. That's this one. And um, the model that fits the data is this one, uh, not these other two. So that's one way to show that the odd man out is winter, as we said. Everyone else acts like they decompose. But um, the better way of showing this is, again, with transition probability. So the, the leakage type words, there are different transition to po probabilities depending on the word, similarly with brother. Um, excursion, transition probability one. Winter, also transition probability one. But this is, this doesn't, the claim is it doesn't matter what, uh, that this is one. There is no decomposition. So when you do a, a regression analysis, we confirm that um, the transition probability for um, le the leakage type words and the brother type words, um, you get a nice regression. The higher the transition probability, the more activity. So where do wi the winter type words and the excursion type words fit? Well, excursion fits exactly where you expect with a transition probability of one. It's on the line, those types of words. Winter words don't. They're just, in fact, they're all over the map, but the average is, is down here. So. 
excursion words are behaving as you would expect if they decompose. And they decompose with the transition probability of one from stem to suffix. Winter words are behaving like they don't decompose. It, this also, by the way, replicates an original finding by Zweig and Puchlinen, who showed more activity for uh, words like farmer over words like winter. However, they use just ER words. So it really was words exactly like farmer and words exactly like winter. We, we're talking here with a, a whole bunch of different words with different suffixes. Okay. So when does, a visual, when does this visual word form area decompose a word? When the grammar says uh, the potentially complex word has identifiable stem and an identifiable suffix. This is independent of the grammaticality of this parsing. So, you know, your brain is pretty stupid. I mean, I mean, you've been reading brother all your life over and over again. Every time the visual word from area says, hey, here's a word I can decompose. And each time it does it, it's wrong. <laughs> Yet, it keeps does it, doing it because that's the way the system has to work. It, you, it's decomposing based on the visual forms of words before you get to the lexicon that tells you about the meanings, right? Um, however, learning, um, is, it, this operation is dependent on learning. You have to learn what the stems are. So a kid first learning English doesn't know that winter doesn't decompose and excursion does. Nothing about the visual form is gonna tell you that. You have to learn that the meaning of excursion and the, and the meaning of shun and the fact that this is a word that's compatible with the grammar if it decompose, whereas winter doesn't mean what it would mean. Okay, so this is what the cognor, uh, with my cognitive neuroscience how it's, how it's I'm telling the linguist about uh, morphemes and morpho morphology, morphological decomposition. I'm telling, um, um, Whose book did I quote? Uh, uh, the Australian linguist, they will remember? Uh, Dixon. Dixon, I'm telling Dixon he's wrong, right? Okay, so now we're gonna move on to something that is, um, it's both geeky and not geeky. You know? I tend to like to think of it in the geeky terms, but, um, uh, but Steve Pinker pushed the same thing, and he, he's not geeky, right? So um, here's an issue that uh, has, can you see the, tree, the trees here a little bit? I mean, they're not complicated, but there are lines here. Can I see? Um, since, um, since Chomsky 1957, <laughs> um, linguists have known that um, tense is a syntactic unit that is, uh, has a syntactic life independent of the verb and has to get on, it, it, when you express tense on the verb, like walked, you have to, you have to get them together somehow, you know. Uh, in, in the 1950s, it was affix hopping. But anyway, there's something that uh, tense is a syntactic entity, and you have to get it together on the verb if you're going to pronounce them together. Now, what's not obvious is perhaps is the connection between, for irregular verbs like gave, give, gave, what the connection is between the give and gave. <laughs> Now, one possibility that's been around a long time is that um, given this type of syntactic structure, gave spells out or realizes a complex part of the structure. It is spelling out both the stem part, the verb part, the give part, and the past tense part, right? So a single form is coming in for a complex structure. The, more boring old fashioned story that um, every, I wouldn't say every, but almost everyone who, who cares about phonology <laughs> believes in is that um, give is the way you pronounce the stem when it's not past tense, but you need to change give into gave in the past tense, right? So, um, on that view, I don't think I've given you a tree on that. But, 
here, here is the, in prose, in distributed morphology, gave is derived in the phonology. That is, when you're figuring out how to pronounce something, you start with give, and you say, uh-uh, I'm in the past tense. I have to change the way I say give, and I get gave in the past tense. In this case, the actual realization of the past tense itself is zero or null. So um, that's the standard view in uh, morphophonology. Uh, and it account, you know, it, 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 there's subregularities sub, sub in the in the irregular past tense, and uh, it's not like the past tense of give is a cat, right? There's a there actually is a phonological connection between give and gave, right? So in distributed morphology, then under the single competence hypothesis. <laughs> Recognizing gave involves recovering the form of give, right? It's not just recovering some abstract uh, morpheme that means giving. You need to recover the form give because give is the form connected to the abstract thing that's giving. So we have a contrast here. In, in in views like, it's, it's called nanosyntax, but it doesn't matter. There are a number of theories that say that, including Pinker's theory, that says that gave is a, a single form that's spelling out plus the, uh, the give and the past tense. And then there's um, uh, the um, other theory that says, no, gave is the pronunciation of give. <laughs> you have to change give into something in the context of the past tense. Again, that sounds kind of geeky, right? It's a kind of little, little thing, but it's very important. Um, so mask priming, I explained this briefly to you before. We're gonna do mask priming with MEG. That is, we're gonna monitor the brains of the, of the people that, uh, the way we, I showed you while they're uh, undergoing this weird paradigm where they see a cross, they see this forward prime, these cross hatches. They see the prime word. And then they see the target. We go from lowercase to uppercase, so there's no visual overlap between prime and target. Uh, the target backwards masks the prime so that you have no conscious recollection of seeing the prime. And in this kind of paradigm, teacher primes teach, brother primes broth, as we said, but brothel does not prime broth because although there's a form relation here, el is not a suffix, and so there's no decomposition. That contrast, by the way, became famous in the uh, in literature. This is a paper by Russell, Davis, and New. The, the contrast between brothel and, and brother and broth is very, you know. You'll hear a lot about that in the literature. So as I said before, mass priming tracks this response to the, uh, from the visual word form area. So the, the Items that prime each other, um, prime their possible stems, are the items that show transition probability effects in this area at 170 milliseconds. So because brother primes broth, brother uh, decomposes, and, and we get transition probability effects at the, uh, at the visual word form area. Um, at this amount of prime exposure, 33 milliseconds, you don't get semantic effects. So cat doesn't prime dog, and you don't get form effects, so brothel doesn't prime broth. So what's accessed at 170 milliseconds? We say the forms of morphemes. So technically, we call them vocabulary items, not the morphemes. So other data from our lab has supported this. So if you have things like wind and wine spelled the same, pronounced differently, different words, or bank and banks spelled the same, pronounced the same, different words, the frequency that counts at the visual word form area is the form frequency. So it's the summed frequency of wind and wind, the sum frequency of the different uses of bank. Later on, the fact that there are two morphemes that are pronounced or, or spelled the same matters. So at 300 milliseconds, the relative frequency of wind and wind versus wind or the relative frequency of bank versus bank that matters, and your brain starts to show sensitivity to it. But at 170 milliseconds, it's the form frequency that counts. Um, so what, we, what, what, what do we predict? If you have to recover the form 
give when you see gave, the form give when you see the form gave, we should expect mass priming effects from gave to give. And the mass priming effects should be visible at this response in the visual word form area at 170 milliseconds. For nanosyntax, since irregular past tense forms are formally simple, or for Steve Pinker for that matter, since irregular past tense forms are formally simple and not related via grammatical rule to the stem form, there should be no decomposition effects. And there should be no mass priming, in fact. So uh, we did the, the relevant uh, comparisons here, regular and irregular past tense. And we got the um, priming effects at the, in the, it says fusiform gyrus, it's the visual word form area. Um, I, don't, I don't want to dwell on the graphs, these are not the interesting ones. So um, this is the, um, the contrast between, um, you can't read this at all. Um, this is, it's give, gave, sorry, gave to give versus an unrelated word to give, you get a big um, difference in the brain response in this area about 170 milliseconds as predicted, okay? Um, now, but that's not the geeky part. The geeky part is that um, the amount of priming you get correlates with the strength of the rule that relates the stem to the past tense. Now, how do we measure the strength of the rule? Well, um, Adam Albright is here, so I'll take a bow. Um, he had a particular um, computational measure of the, basically the amount of support a given um, uh, relationship between a past tense and a stem gets from other irregular verbs in the language. But he has a number, and since the number is of the strength of the rule is a continuous variable, we can correlate that number with our results. And um, the past tense forms with the high Albright scores show large priming, while those with low Albright sc scores show low priming. And this is uh, as a binary, there's a, there's a continuous a correlation with Albright score and priming, and this is just the binary comparison. On the left, high Albright score, you see a big priming effect. On the right, low Albright sc score, you don't see a, um, a priming effect. Now, when I present this to psychologists, you know, their eyes glaze over and they go like, what? <laughs> But that, that's the past. Now, with the new rebirth of cognitive science, right, they're going to say, yay, Albright score, give me more measures like that, right? <laughs> right, because what basically, um, you know, 10 years ago, um, outside of behavioral studies, it was very difficult to use um, continuous variables to analyze um, um, evoke, particularly evoke response data like uh, MEG, EEG. I started trying to do this about 10 years ago, and um, you know, I, I, I was breaking MATLAB. That was partly because I didn't, I, and I'm not a computer scientist, and I wasn't doing things efficiently, but it was very difficult to, to do this. But now, anyone can do it with you know, their laptop, right? So the, the, uh, the, the psychologists are, are now more interested in variables that you can motivate and they can use. You know? In fact, they can go back to old experiments and uh, reanalyze their data with, uh, with the variables that you're suggesting. Um, but this is, this is you know, not an um, insignificant finding. Um, we have evidence that the irregular past tense forms, right, it's the, the, the visual form gave is analyzed into the form of the stem give at the same stage of processing in which form-based decomposition takes place, right? So farmer, farm ER, gave into give, and past tense. So you can look it up in your, uh, in your, in your uh, semantic lex lexicon that connects with semantics. And the recovery of the stem form is modulated by the strength of the irregular formation rule. 
And this is not predicted by any theory that claims that irregular past tense forms are formally simple, like nanosyntax or Pinker. Okay. So Kaha, uh, this, this, this nanosyntactician asks uh, in the title of his, his paper, uh, nanosyntax and distributed morphology, which one is right? Well, the brain tells us which one is right. Yeah. Um, now let's move quickly. We have uh, five to 10 minutes to move to auditory word recognition, uh, where I'm gonna tell you a very similar story. That is, uh, linguists have informed neuroscience work that tells us something about the way that a particular part of the brain does language processing. Now we can use that information to answer questions that are, of, that are open in linguistics. So um, recently, um, linguistically informed neuroscience, that is neuroscientists who talk to linguists, um, have discovered phonetic feature detectors in the human superior temporal cortex. These detectors respond selectively to the distinctive features of phonemes at about 100 milliseconds after the onset of the phonemes. And just for, you know, to put this in context, the signal from the ears reaches the cortical surface of the brain around 50 milliseconds. So with between 50 and 100 milliseconds, there's processing that, uh, that leads to detection of um, phonetic features. This is, from, this is a paper from Science. Um, a group, uh, it's, it's Chang's group, Keith Johnson, and you recognize he's the linguist involved here. Um, this is a slide here, and I have this because this, um, uh, on the upper left you can see the location of these um, uh, neurons that are, are placed on the cortical surface of a patient who's going to undergo brain surgery, probably for epilepsy. And so they have the brain open for a while before the surgery. Uh, they're looking for, uh, you know, the, 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 the neurons are there mostly to uh, try to help localize the, uh, where the, spike, the epileptic spiking is coming from so they can take it out. But you know, while you're in the hospital with, uh, neuro, uh, with um, electrodes on your brain, you know, why not do an experiment or two, right? Um, and so they're, you're just listening to sentences. Uh, these, are, these are actually naturalistic sentences from the timid corpus that's been wide, widely used in, um, uh, which is, it, for those uh, who don't, the Texas Instruments MIT. Yeah. It's long, uh, anyway. So, and you, you, you snip out the parts that are associated with different sounds, and you ask what's in, what, what do, what's in, in common on the activity of these electrodes that it correlates with the, with the sounds. And what they discover is something that would make uh, Morris Halley's heart uh, beat faster. Um, basically, they're discovering an organization of responses that's organized according to distinctive features, like voice versus voiceless, point of articulation, those kinds of things. And uh, for us, what's important is the area of the brain, the superior temporal uh, lobe, and the timing, about 100 milliseconds after the start of the, of the sound. Um, and this is just uh, um, here a summary of what they found. Superior temporal gyrus participates in high order auditory processing of speech. Um, subjects listen to continuous speech. We found response selectivity to distinct phonetic features. So that's nice. Now, the other thing we've learned, um, I mean, linguistics didn't tell us this had to be true, but it is true. As you hear a word, you predict upcoming sounds based on what's called the cohort of words consistent with the sounds you've already heard. So you've heard um, um, uh, ba, and you think all the words that start with ba, that's the cohort. And given the relative frequencies of those words, you make probabilistic pr predictions about what the next sound is going to be. It's true. Moreover, and this is what we've done in our lab, um, the, the, the uh, mismatch between what you predict and what you get, probabilistically speaking, shows up as a signal at these same area of the brain that you see up there 
at the same time point that sensitivity to phonetic features is being analyzed. So in other words, you're, the prediction is there at the feature detectors before you get the signal indicating which feature you actually uh, did hear. And the relationship between what's predicted and what, what, what is processed shows up as a signal that we measure there. Um, now, this signal turns out to be modulated by morphological structure. So if you're hearing a word like farmer, your prediction isn't based uh, simply on the whole world, whole, I always say that, whole word frequency of farmer. It's based on the having recognized farm what's the likelihood of ER versus other words. So it's modulated by the morphological processing. Um, and that's, we, we've shown this here, and it's, you know, you can compare bathing or, um, versus bourbon. You know, uh, two syllable words, some of them are morphologically complex, some of them are not. Uh, and we're looking at activity in this area, and we have um, a measure of phoneme surprisal that is modulated by whether the word is bimorphemic or monomorphemic. Okay. I don't want to talk about this results here, just show you that this is the type of stuff that you do. This isn't telling us anything about linguistics, but it is using linguistics to um, study how the brain does this stuff. Okay. But given this, there is a question for linguistics that we can address. Is the Semitic root a morpheme? <laughs> now in contemporary uh, root-centered theories like distributed morphology that I've been talking about, the triliteral consonantal root, uh, like KTB of Arabic uh, words, uh, could be the phonological realization of a node uh, in the syntax. Uh, that is, could be the representation of a morpheme. And there are other theories, however, say that you do not decompose to the root, uh, but rather to a stem that contains the root and uh, other material. So uh, Laura Williams and I addressed this by um, looking at Arabic. The nice thing about being in Abu Dhabi is not only do you have a nice supply of English speakers for English experiments, you have a good supply of Arabic speakers for your Arabic uh, experiments. We just learned Greek speakers for your Greek experiments, and you, you name it, we have a good supply of speakers for the experiments. Um, so, the root morpheme in, in Semitic languages interleave with vowels and a consonant vowel shape that's associated with other um, uh, syntactic and semantic information. Um, so the question is, are Arabic words processed through their constituent morphemes or as wholes? Now, as I just said, you use your uh, knowledge of uh, things like transition probability from stem to suffix to predict up, upcoming sounds during auditory word recognition. But we can ask, um, actually let me show you, uh, we can ask, are you, um, when you recognize a word like kataba, are you predicting the bo based on the probability of kata, the whole word, or are you predicting the bo based on the probabil uh, probability of the root? ignoring the, the, the whole word that you're processing. So we can compute um, surprisal at the buh based on either the frequency of the word with respect to the frequency of the beginning of the word or the frequency of the root with re respect to the frequency of the first two letters of the root, um, which we call linear surprisal based on the word or morphological surprisal based on the root. Now, here we needed to get the help of a computational linguist to, get, uh, to help us with the, uh, with the corpus statistics. And in particular, we needed to discorrelate uh, root and word uh, surprisal, which are otherwise would be very highly correlated. So we got a set of words that all are CV, 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 C. Sorry, CV, CV, CV. <laughs> Three syllables, CV, CV, CV. And this is the distribution of morphological surprisal as uh, uh, graphed against linear surprises, you can see that there's, they're discorrelated uh, over the set. Um, and so we're asking, you know, which measure of surprisal correlates to the brain activity? At the relevant time interval, 100 milliseconds after the onset of the phoneme, in the relative part of the brain, the superior temporal lobe that we know from uh, cognitive neuroscience is relevant. 
And um, the answer, of course, is it's the root surprisal. Uh, if I can get that to come up here. <laughs> up, up, the color is bad. Oh, what a disappointment. Can you see that? <laughs> the red line is root surprisal. And here, just 120 milliseconds after the onset of the phoneme, this the root surprisal is is correlating with the uh, with the magnitude of activity at this area. Um, it's really hard to see, but you get a little bit of whole word surprisal uh, later. So it's not that the uh, the uh, the probability of the sound based on the whole word is not relevant at all, but it's not relevant at this crucial time point when you're processing, initially processing the sound. It, it, I'm, I'll put the slides online because it's, it's much better when you can actually see the colors here. You can see the pink but not the, the, the blue. Okay, so a thumbs up for the consonantal root is the form realization of a morpheme. So the Semitic root defines the relevant cohort for predicting upcoming phonemes during auditory word recognition. So, in summary, the single competence hypothesis, that is, you know, cognitive science from the 1950s, allows us to test representational claims against data from neuro and psycholinguistic experiments, but given enough understanding of the paradigms and hypothesis spaces. That's one way of saying that, you know, I try to present to you that we know a lot about the areas of the brain I was looking at and the time, relevant time regions of responses. So I didn't say, ah, I, I looked all over the brain at any time and I found something that correlates with the rooted. I found the root area, you know, and I didn't say that. I said, given all the stuff we know about how reading works and how hearing words work, we made specific predictions from linguistic theory that we were able to test. Um, It's not, though, the case, I don't want to leave you with the impression that um, those of us with the expensive toys always win, right? <laughs> well, that's nice to say. So at Harvard, one could say that, right? But, um, but you know, this is, I, I, this is data I've given you guys, right? So you can, you know, if you're a nanosyntactician, you can try to come up, you can come up with alternative explanations of this data. Uh, but you, but the idea is you have to do that. <laughs> you can't say no. It's it's from people's brains. How is that relevant to my linguistic theory, right? <laughs> um, as I said, data are data. Brain wiggles, brain wiggles don't trump intuitions or any other sort of data. Uh, thank you. I wanted to thank these people as well as funding from the um, NYU Abu Dhabi Research Institute. I have gone a little bit long, but I think there's time for questions, objections. Must be questions. From Adam. Yes. Just a very general question. When you gave these examples with linger, right, and you said, well, they are sort of concepts as a word, as a word of that. Now, they're also poets. As I said, it's a very general. Still, it's sort of a fact that poets can sort of manipulate certain data, right? So I was so that they sort of you know maybe words that are non-decomposable become composable. That's so right. I was wondering sort of what are your thoughts on it, and sort of you know do you know of any research about that? Because I'm, I'm sort of especially intrigued by the fact because of this violation of an expectation, right? Because I'm interested in sort of you know expressiveness, right? So and that's typically what poets do, right? They violate a certain rule. So an item which is non-decomposable, in a way, they try to make it composable, right, in order to get sort of this violation of the expectation. Right. I mean, this, this, you, uh, the question about how um, how artist how art works, in particular, uh, poetry or poetic language, literary language, where um, the idea is to uh, draw conscious attention to language in some way. And whether, so 
for example, if you, uh, you know, if you start a poem by saying, in winter we all went in, um, into the evening. And you say, now, I'm not a poet, so, you know, the, um, there would be no reason for, me, for anyone to write a poem like that. But someone, you know, but, but one can imagine, right? So, um, you know, what we can say is that that requires work, and that's conscious work. But um, what I don't know is something, uh, something you know, that, that sort of, I'm becoming a lot more aware of um, for various reasons. So um, there are things that seem um, unavailable in, in processing that, that should be available. So um, for example, a lot of psycholinguists, instead of using brother as an example of a word that um, looks like it could decompose because it has a broth in it, they use corner. And now, there, there's, no, there's no reason in English why you can't have a verb to corn. In fact, it, it exists. And so why, you know, but the meaning of corner as someone who corns is really unavailable. Now, why is that? And that's something I'd like to understand. Now, the one person who is working on this type of question is this question about, partially a question about learning and a relationship between learning and processing is Charles Yang, and he's asking this question like, when, when does something become, um, in a sense, improbable enough to be unavailable, if that's what he's saying? Yeah. So the thing about wind is that it's, um, it's not playing on something like, it's not like corner because you are explicitly creating, you know, you know that you're trying to create a verb that doesn't exist. So you're not playing against someone's um, statistical expectations about the verb to wind. And, and it might be that poetry involves this, uh, when, it's, when it's calling attention to language, it has to work against things that are, are inaccessible, even though they're allowable, like corner, <laughs> and things that are inaccessible um, for, um, because they don't yet fit the grammar, right, like winter, like to wind. Right? Uh, but I don't, know if, I don't know of anyone who's studied this particular thing using contemporary brain imaging techniques, but poetic use of language is a very, um, is a topic that a lot of linguists have, have worked on. Including uh, Jay Kaiser, he's not here, but he's written about this. So. Um, so this question about um, the relationship between uh, morphological processing and acquisition and you know the words you know is 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 really important. And the particular question you asked has been asked in the experimental literature recently, but I don't remember what the answer was. Um, and it, but it, but I do remember why it was interesting because um, you say, isn't it a isn't it potentially a problem for English that you have these um, you know this constant misparsing? Right? Wouldn't languages tend to avoid this? Now it turns out for various reasons that have to do with the inflectional morphology of different languages, languages actually avoid this. So um, you say, well, what are the where are the brother word studies in other languages? They have to be done in a different way because there aren't brother words in a number of, of your standard European languages. Um, moreover, um, when I first did this, uh, when my own study on the brother words. Uh, started by getting all of the brother words in English, which, of which there aren't too many. And then, um, 
uh, we were looking at um, the relationship between the um, um, transition probability is a, re is a re for these words is a relationship between the frequency of the stab broth and the frequency of the word brother, right? And we were asking um, uh, over the family of brother. If, if you take a word like farmer or baker, those kinds of words, right? Your intuition might be that um, the higher the frequency of the stem, the more times people use the verb to farm, the more likely far there you have farmer. And there's a correlation between the whole word and the, and the frequency of the stem, which is true. But it's also true for the brother words. So there's a correlation across the set of brother words. There's a correlation between the frequency of broth and the frequency of brother. Now, why would that be? If anyone has an idea, let me know. I, try, I, I tested every idea I came up with, and they were all wrong. So, uh, uh, and then you think, well, um, I mean, there there's a lot of homophony among different types of suffixes. Like ing has a lot of different meanings. Even s has different meanings. What's the, um, what's the, uh, the, what's called the morphological family of these broth words? And, and why, doesn't it get confused with broth? Well, the broth words in standard corpora have no morphological families. <laughs> so you, apparently you never, in, in, in normal uses, no one ever adds an affix to broth. <laughs> you think, well, that's probably not an accident either. <laughs> so the, the existence of these pairs, like broth and brother, uh, is probably a conspiracy of factors about English. And um, so, but, but, but you ask a more interesting question, which is, and the fact is, yes, the um, decomposition depends on um, does depend on vocabulary size and 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 the extent of your uh, of your knowledge of language, and so these decomposition of the mask priming effects uh, develop over time, and there is a literature on this, but I don't. But for the life of me, I I, I don't remember what the what what the upshot of it is. <laughs> Look it up in Google Scholar, you'll find it. Um, so, is there a relationship between technological advancement and illiteracy? Now, I, there's, a, there's a presupposition here that, that we have, a, that there's somehow a growing illiteracy problem, which I would deny. So, um, it is true, however, and lots of people are studying this, that there is there are changes in written communication that, it, well, written now it's typed communication that relates, for example, uses of cell phone, the uses of uh, the, form, the form of uh, the way you do things with tweets, twits, through t Twitter, right? The, that short form communication and all that uh, people are studying. But uh, the, I guess there, there's, there are there, um, I guess if there are, uh, Japanese or Chinese scholars here. I mean, the, 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 it is true that the, uh, the uh, computer input of, um, of Chinese characters and then uh, kanji for Japanese uh, has, has, you know, has affected uh, people's ability to, 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 to write characters. They don't remember how to write them, but they know the characters because when you know, part of the input, they have to choose which one to use, and then they, they, they read them. They can't. They don't. Uh, they don't freely write them anymore. Uh, but I don't know why I'm, uh, I'm. I'm. I'm just spouting out things I know that are interesting. But you know, it's a, I, I, the interest. I don't have anything to, uh, particular to say about your your question, except to uh, deny. I think I would like to deny a presupposition that there is some increasing uh, illiteracy. But. Yes. That was the, the, the Arabic, yeah, yeah. yeah.
Yep. Um, so, I mean, having a phonological difference, as the GIF gauge stuff uh, showed, is not an obstacle to positing that there is, in fact, a meaningful linguistic relationship. Yeah. That would not be a regular relationship in English, although Bot Mud and Mother and Bot Brud and Brother, there are several of these, but there's also a lot of Bot, uh, there's also a Bot and Not Other. Right. Right, so there's a uh, there's a lot behind that question. So and that, um, and some 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 of it I know something about, and some I don't. But um, so one question is about um, whether you know the relationship between, say, regularities in the orthogra or orthographic, uh, so you might call allomorphy or changes in form, and 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 in the auditory modality. And I would suspect that, the, uh, you know, particularly like with the, the, the past tense stuff, seems like the written, I mean, I, I don't have the, the resolution in the experiments to do this yet, but I would guess that the, 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 the Albright scores for the written forms are, are parasitic on the, on, the, on the phonological representations. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, in, uh, there's a lot of information, you know, a lot of fact that, that um, there's a, you know, um, the, the, there's um, incredible crosstalk between the uh, orthographic and the uh, auditory representations. Um, uh, and this answer the question, so, uh, the auditory processing of illiterates, for example, is, is different from literates. That is, learning to read affects auditory processing, and this has been shown recently. Um, but and then, but the, but there is you're running up against you know this other question about you know possible generalizations. Well, maybe bro brother is brought with some phonological change, and in, in the context of ER, um, my understanding of people who work on like you who work on uh, morphological learning is that there's and and now from Charles Yang's work, it's uh, so that that would be something that a, ch a child sh should be in the hypothesis space of a child, but would be uh, not supported by the. Um, by statistical properties of English, right? And just to get the opposite case of the auditory skills for sister, you know, that the word cyst in English is just right. not, you know, so you could actually look at That's true. how it goes the opposite direction. Right, so what we don't have is, um, so I, the evidence I have from English on morphological processing and the auditory modality is at the moment just boring. It's, it, it, I showed you, it basically I sh it, uh, you don't get what you expect if people were hearing words as wholes. You're getting predictions of the end of words based on uh, decomposition of the word. But I don't have any specificity in, the, in what I said about that. That's a very um, general statement. That's, it's enough to get, it got, you know, it got me excited at the time, but you know, a few years later, I want more, you know, give me more. I don't have anything more to say about it. I don't know what type of experiments I should be doing, which is why I moved to Arabic, where it's, it was more clear what, 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 the, what the sexy stuff would be, right? Yes. Yes. You would like to suggest the caveat to the single hypo uh, single competence hypothesis. I would prefer not to not to have, not to you know not to come with any warning signs. But yes, what what would you suggest? What's the problem? Okay, so let me, um, I, I can say something about this. So, um, yeah, I could say two things of interest, perhaps. So let's go back to 1950s, right? Um, 
and you know, Chomsky and Miller, who the George Miller, were, are worried about um, multiple center embedding. Right? The, I, can, I, I, I can artificially try to say these things, the cat, the mouse, the dog, uh, bit chase state, I don't know. Something. But you, know, you have these um, multiple embeddings are impossible to process, right? And the hypothesis was, says, well, they, they're, they're grammatical, um, that they should have gone back and forth. I think these days we'd still say that they're grammatical. And um, the reason why we can't uh, uh, process them has something to do with the interaction of the use of linguistic knowledge with uh, memory systems in some sense, right? And you know, the same thing uh, is, is, is presumably true today. And there are interesting areas like um, I'm hoping that my inability to process uh, quantifier scope without heavy context is related to my um, verbal short-term memory deficit, which is extreme. You know, otherwise, I'm just stupid, which would be bad. Um, so the answer is, uh, yeah, always you, in, you need to under, understand um, how, what kind of resources people are using also to make judgments of grammaticality. Because if you ask, you know, no matter how many times you ask uh, a subject uh, whether um, the horse race past the barn fell is grammatical, they're going to say it's not grammatical, right? But we know that that's wrong. It is grammatical, right? But there's no way to process it. You know, I can't, I, I've heard that sentence for, you know, for 30 years. I still can't process it, right? But there's another aspect to your question, which is about um, why wasn't it obvious, for example? I, there, were, there were frequency things all through my talk, right? So frequencies of all sorts um, matter for processing. But as a linguist, Almost without exception, none of those frequencies are part are part of the linguistic representation of a sentence or what I put in the competence, right? So the fact that, um, um, say, wind and wind have a particular relative frequency, that affects people's processing of reading the word W-I-N-D or hearing wine, in fact. Right? But I'm claiming as a linguist that nowhere in that grammar I write for a speaker am I going to have those frequencies because nothing about the linguistic system cares, it doesn't, it cares about it. It doesn't say, you know, 40%, you know if it's 40%, uh, raise the vowel or, you know, right? So that could be wrong. Right. So, in a sense, there were there were all sorts of things in, our, in my experiments that were not that were not linguistic confidence things that were going into the predictions of behavior and experiment. In particular, all sorts of frequencies. I, I will after you say your sentence, yes. Okay. So that this is um, evidence that we need something like the adjustment rules that are giving us this, you know, stem allomorphy as opposed to maybe something, you know, that maybe spells out a whole chunk at once, like you can talk about nanosyntax or maybe something about spanning that sort of thing that gets all one. Yes, that spanning is part of nanosyntax. Yes. Oh, well. It, they're the same thing. That's fine. So, what's the question? Yeah. So, the question so, that is basically what you're saying. But then, to the extent that I understand um, the data and the argument, it appears to me also the fact that maybe things work like this for sort of <coughs> recognizing and recovering or sort of interpreting what word is being used, it doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, specifically readjustment is the only way to get things like root depletion. It could just be that perhaps. Then in the cases where it's just total unrecognizable depletion, there's no sort of mechanism of resemblance that makes processing go 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the idea is I said that um, uh, the, I was comparing two competing theories. One said that you have, gave is spelling out a whole thing, so there's no, the, when you, if you're gonna get to the syntax and semantics of a sentence with gave in it, you never get give. The form give, you get the abstract morpheme give, you get the, and that's one theory. The other theory says no, in order to get gave, you have to, you have to go backwards, you have to get the form give and the rule, you call it readjustment rule that goes to give the gave, right? And you said, well, maybe there's something, some other way that the re phonological relationship or orthographic relationship between the stem and the past tense could be used or interact when you see the past tense that might explain the data, something like that, right? Yeah, so there's two things to be said. One is single competence hypothesis, um, you know, we had two theories of competence. We're applying them directly. Say so you use your competence, you know, and we have got different predictions. But even more so, I gave you numerical predictions from a theory, right? Adam Albright, you can, you know, you can, you can, he can tell you if you're if I'm wrong here. He didn't say I'm going to derive this number by looking at brain data or looking at, even by looking at reaction time in lexical decision experiments. He says I'm going to derive this number by a consideration of a theory of how children learn the relationship between the uh, past tense and the stem. From that, you got a number that's relevant in, at this visual word form area during uh, reading. Ah, well, pretty, I, 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 you know, we can take a vote here. I think that's pretty impressive. <laughs> As, you know, and you're saying, well, maybe there's another explanation, yeah. Two things, one is the way you describe it would be adding something processing specific to the account, right? That says there's something, you know, there's some other thing you're doing to help you or speed things up, slow things down or something. Yeah, that's possible. And it sounded like a, you know, something you're adding in order to explain this data rather than explain, some, you know, than in, in general. But, yeah, absolutely. That's, I think that was my last slide, you know? come up with the alternative, we can test it. But you, you haven't, um, again, we can vote, but I don't think you've presented something that's attractive at the moment. You didn't say spanning, you didn't really get it right because spanning as applied to you know, the Greek perfect <laughs> by, by some, you know, you know, really makes this other prediction and, and comes up with that number plus some more numbers. You said we could add something to cover this data, which is, does, it doesn't make this side of the room happy. They're going, nah. Yes? So when you talk about the translation from a meaning for words like uh, excursion and bracket, uh, how do we know we are talking about the different type of translation from a meaning that you are interested in, or just something very naive, say, a chunk of this word can be recognized as a, as a Right, so that's part of the, uh, the, the, the setup of this experiment is to compare words like winter. We know that a chunk of that word can be recognized as a suffix, right? Brother, chunk of that word can be recognized as a suffix. Excursion, a chunk of that word can be recognized as a suffix. But they have different properties with respect to the grammar of English. So that's how I know, right? So I, we did consider, we, the, uh, the uh, obvious alternative to how these things are recognized, those are hypotheses that we um, had in mind and disconfirmed them. Yes? So, so I can, maybe there is another way to, to do the control, just add something word that, that not, does not exist in English. So for instance, brother versus brother. <laughs> and so because this word does not exist, it then makes no sense to have this transition from a beating at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, see, the, see we're, we're getting at, um, there's, a, there's a number of things about what, what kind of alternatives we should consider and how, how to approach it. Um, so 
when you give someone a string of letters that's not a word, um, the, ta the task is different from when it's, it's a word. So I, I, I told you these were lexical decisions experiments. In fact, we were giving people um, strings of words that included non-words of the sort you mentioned. That is, in fact, a lot of the non-words had suffixes because we wanted to make sure that people couldn't make a lexical decision just by seeing that there's a suffix. In the experiment, if you just saw ER, you couldn't push the button, yes, it's a word, because there were things that ended in ER that were non-words, right? But the brain responses and the behavioral responses to non-words are very different than to words, and it's not, um, get, now you have hypothesis, nice, okay, again, the nice thing about the 21st century now is that the kinds of experiments we do and the way we choose our stimuli are such that we can uh, post-talk, go back to the data and um, consider alternative hypotheses, reanalyze the data without violating um, 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 uh, principles of inferential statistics. Uh, so I could, we can ask about, you know, we can ask, you could, if you um, um, uh, make even more clear your alternative hypotheses or your hypotheses about the non-words, it's possible to test those. But I want to say that the brain, um, by 300 milliseconds after you see a string of letters, the non-words and the words, the, the, they're very separating in, in, in their sensitivity to, to stimulus properties as you start to uh, make contact with the lexicon. So. Absolutely. So the prediction, I mean, I could have stopped at the demonstration. I mean, the for nano syntax, there's no reason given how I explain the cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience of the response from the visual word form area. There's no reason why um, nano syntacticians should expect mass priming from Gabe to give, okay? But. I, you know, if I was a nanosynthetic tactician, I, would, I, I, I wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be overwhelmed by that. So I just want to go a step further. But in terms of distributed morphology, though, this is a crucial question. So, um, which gets asked to me all the time by people like Jason Merchant, who apparently doesn't hang out with penologists enough, you know. And he says, look, you know, you have, if, if you're forced to say that, um, idiosyncratic groups of morphemes undergo their own phonological processes and morphological contexts, why not just say it's all suppletion, right? All right? So go when there's no phonological process there, so it's give, gave, you know? And moreover, he sees suppletion everywhere anyway, so you know, it's fine, right? But you know, that would make you know, Morris Halley pause because there is a fact of the matter. There, there are generalizations to be stated over uh, subparts of the lexicon, and we have, every, you know, there's a lot of psycholinguistic literature on this now that you know, people know these generalizations. They learn them. So uh, I think that's why it's important. So you know, what are they learning? And, um, you know, I, I'm being a little um, disingenuous here. So. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I, I would not necessarily have staked anything on, on, on orthography. You know? <laughs> you know, I would, and, but now, the more I learn, the more comfortable I am. The point, you know, if, you, the, if you're really claiming that um, there's a difference between suppletion, where you have two separate forms, both of which make contact with the same abstract morpheme, and um, readjustment rules or phonology where you have a single form that undergoes changes, well, um, I think you are committed to saying that whenever you process the, the one with the readjustment, you have to, you know, to, to get to the lexical item, you have to get the form. 
You have to undo the blue thing. You know? And so it, you know, that's where the prediction comes. But you're right. In terms of the setup of the experiment, it, it, the, the, there was a binary distinction. And the nanosyntacticians and uh, you know, Pinker says um, there's, you, know, you don't go to the give form in order to get the lexicon. And the Albright number was, uh, was, immature, was not, was not um, relevant. Oh, it's, the idea is, is it's, it's <coughs> kind of like transition probabilities. Like what makes um, uh, getting to the form you need to make contact with the lexicon, what makes that more or less difficult? Now, at the moment, it seems, I'm, I'm not, I don't fully get it myself, that the higher the transition probability from stem to suffix, for example, the more work you need to do to get the forms you need to get to the lexicon. I mean, I, I, there were reasons why that might be true, and it seems to be true. So what, you know, what would modulate your going from gave to give? If you're really doing the rules, it should be something like the frequency of the rules. And the Albright number isn't exactly that. It's something else. And what, that, but that's a, 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 Adam can tell me if I'm wrong. It's a, actually a matter of, interest in the, liter the people that study these things is like, what is the, it says the measure of difficulty? Is it, is it frequency based? Is it type based? Is it based on, uh, on, on a different notion of distance and so forth? So those are all open questions that maybe the brain data can help, um, you know, can have something to say about it. But this is just a question of trying to derive a notion of how difficult it would be to go from the um, past tense to the step. Let's thank the speaker and resume.